Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the Sunday Night Battle Cry with Mark Meckler. Of course, I'm your host, Mark Meckler. I'm wandering through the studio right now, the famous or maybe infamous Levi behind him is Winston. And you might hear some noise because we also have my daughter and son-in-law's dogs running around, a couple of white huskies. It's a little bit crazy here, but that's the way we like it. We love our dogs around here. I would have 10 probably if my wife would let me. Thank God she's sane because 10 dogs would be too much. Four is a lot, but we're going to share them with you tonight. All right. I want to first kind of give you the call to action this week. And the call to action is we have the Convention of States simulated convention coming up in Colonial Williamsburg. I'm super excited about that. I'm going to be there. They're going to be commissioners from all 50 states there, I believe. The only one that's still pending is Rhode Island. By the way, they didn't attend the original Convention of States, the Constitutional Convention. So be interesting to see if we can ultimately get a delegate. Are they going to repeat what they did at the original Constitutional Convention back in 1787? In any event, you can go, you can be involved by watching it live online. You can do that by going to cossimulation2023.org, cossimulation2023.org. You can watch it on the 4th. It'll be the main final session. I'll be going live during the convention, talking about what's going on there. Uh, you can also sign up there to do a watch party, and I really recommend that. So this is the big call to action. Plan your watch party. Plan it for the 4th, August 4th. Uh, that's August 4th coming up. Go to COS simulation2023.org and producer G will throw that up on the screen for you so you don't have to just remember what I'm saying. It's a crazy week. Every week in the news is a crazy week and that makes it kind of easy to do the Sunday Night Battle Cry, but it also sometimes you got to pare down what's out there that's crazy. I'm going to start with something that you might not have noticed. In fact, I'm guessing most of you didn't notice. I noticed this because I'm a lawyer. And one thing I've been noticing since I've been a lawyer, and this goes back to the 80s, I graduated from law school in 1988, is that lawyers are getting dumber. Now, that's not something unique to lawyers. Everybody in society seems to be getting dumber because we're dumbing down everything in this society. You know, when I went to law school, I'm going to be frank, it was hard. It was really hard for me. And I think I ended up my top 11 or 12% of my class, something like that, roughly, and that was as good as I could do. I mean, I worked really hard for that. I just wasn't a number one guy in my law school class. And I didn't go to a number one law school either, but it was hard. I mean, I remember reading hundreds and hundreds of pages every night. I remember getting up early in the morning and going to the library to study before law school. I remember after law school was over and breaks between classes, mostly I studied. I would go to the gym during lunch and listen to Rush Limbaugh. He was on in Sacramento back then, which is where I went to law school. But it was hard. And as I've grown older and I've talked to law students in recent days and in the last 10 years even, they don't think it's very hard. And I don't feel like they're that much smarter. And so I kind of dug in and I realized, well, they're not doing as much work as we were doing. They're not doing as much reading as we were reading. They're not pressed as hard as we were pressed. And I think that's bad. I think when you're talking about professional careers, when you're talking about engineers and lawyers and doctors and people who require serious advanced degrees like that, it should be hard because you want to know that the people that you're hiring have gone through difficult things and learned hard things and put in the time to be competent at what they do. And I, I want to clarify, no lawyer is competent when they come out of law school. That's why they call it the practice of law. And it takes time. You build up that practice essentially over time. You apprentice, even though it's not official, you go in as a junior lawyer and you learn your craft and you learn from senior lawyers. But there was a news item this week that caught my attention. And the news item said that they are now going to make the bar exam significantly easier. And it was written, there was a, there was a, it was written by Judge Josh Blackman, one of my favorite circuit court judges. And he had recently talked to a bar examiner who had resigned. Somebody who writes the questions, who reads the exams, and he resigned because they are making now a uniform bar exam, and the goal is to make it as easy as possible. He said even when he was writing questions for the state bar exam, this person who was writing the email, they were telling him, make sure that you do anything you have to do to make the bar exam questions easy. And what we used to do is you would have multiple issues in a single bar exam, so you had to make sure you were spotting all those issues. Those issues played together in different ways, in different fact patterns. It was hard and you had to write the essays. And so a lot of the bar exams are now starting to get rid of the essay portion and going to full multiple choice. By the way, just in case you're wondering, 
you know, having been a lawyer for as long as I have, I've never seen a multiple choice question in a law practice. But this is not how it works. I mean, you have to be able to reason your way through the issues, spot the issues. Law school is a way of teaching you how to think, not how to be a lawyer, but how to think like a lawyer. And so now what they're doing is they're removing that from all the testing. And so basically what, what this examiner said is he resigned from being an examiner because they're making it too easy to pass the bar. They're making it so idiots, so people who can't even reason can pass the bar. And I know this from talking to young law students too, that a lot of their compatriots in their classes are not bright, to be blunt. Got in from some special circumstance, maybe some special quota, some diversity initiative that got them into law school. And I can tell you that when I went to law school, I didn't meet many people who weren't bright. I didn't necessarily like them all. I thought there were a lot of big egos. We might have disagreed politically, but man, they were mostly really smart people. And again, to be fair, I didn't go to a top tier law school. I'm not the sharpest tool in the shed. Maybe that's why I thought everybody was so smart, but I, of, I met a lot of really smart people. So now what we have is the national bar exam. They're trying to dumb that down so that stupider people, less committed people, less hardworking people can be lawyers. God save all of us. Speaking of dumb people doing dumb things, uh, the New York Police Department, according to New York Court, is now has to pay millions of dollars. I think the number is $12 million, bringing the settlements in New York State alone to $35 million that have to be paid by the police and by officials for the mistreatment of the mostly peaceful rioters during the George Floyd riots. And let's remember those riots, shall we? I think those were the riots that involved mayhem, uh, physical damage, people being killed, property damage, firebombing, violence. And so now literally tens of millions of dollars will be paid out to people who did those things. There was also, by the way, another settlement in New York this week that came out and said that they're gonna pay tens of millions of dollars to people of color who failed the teacher's exam, failed the teacher's exam. I think there was one guy that they said that had failed it dozens and dozens of times. They're going to owe him something like $10 million. I mean, this is just outrageous. What they're going to do is they're going to pay incompetent people because they were not competent. But they say it's because the test was racially biased, racially biased based on outcome, not because they could point to a single question on the exam that was in some way racially biased. I would be entirely opposed to that, but they didn't present any evidence of that. They just said because people of color passed it at a lower rate. And so in other words, again, somehow in some way they should have rewritten the test so that no matter whether you had were competent to be a teacher, you would have been a teacher. Dumbing down lawyers, paying millions of dollars <coughs> to people who did violent, terrible stuff in and rioted in the streets of New York and did incredible damage in, especially in communities of color. This is the gross and growing stupidity of the woke United States of America. It's absolutely incredible. And wokeism is under attack, but nowhere near dead and nowhere near on the run. But I think there are signs of hope. If we head over to North, I think it's Northwestern University in the engineering department, they recently put out a survey two engineering students, which was all about DEI, had a bunch of stupid questions on it, including asking people, <laughs> excuse me, about what their gender was. And I guess it was very offensive, really offensive to some of the professors who are conducting this study, some of the DEI experts conducting the study, because some in the engineering department wrote that their gender was an Apache attack helicopter. That's pretty good, huh? A survey about culture, about gender culture, or sorry, engineering culture, and the kids answered a bunch of outrageous, ridiculous stuff, as they should, as you should if you ever get asked this kind of stuff, and they mocked it and they made fun of it. So the academics said that this demonstrate that fascism is on the rise in America, and specifically in STEM. Uh, yes, that's right, fascism, because students thought these questions were ridiculous and gave funny answers to them. And in fact, apparently, even some of the staff that were reviewing the answers to the survey, they said they were so hurt and so distraught that they had to take time off to deal with their feelings, right? So that's what university is all about today. It's about the feels, and it's about not having your feelings hurt, and it's about 
diversity, equity, and inclusion, which is the place where universities go to die. Thank God, and it gives me hope that some of these students, they said it was something like 25%, it was a significant percentage, actually wrote responses that indicated that they thought this stuff was ridiculous and asinine because it is. All right, next we're gonna do the presidential update. And this is something that we have to do. We gotta do this every single week, whether I want to or not, kind of like leg day in my gym. Sometimes I don't wanna do it, but you gotta do it anyway, because otherwise you won't know what's going on and because that's what's front and center in the news. All right, so who's up and who's down right now? Uh, the two leading candidates still remain uh, President Donald Trump and Governor Ron DeSantis. And Donald Trump, it seems, keeps going up in the polls. And every time somebody threatens to prosecute him or do something to him or say that he's doing something wrong, he goes up in the polls, tends to come back down a little bit and level out. And Ron DeSantis, what's Ron DeSantis doing? I want to give a caveat because people are going to get mad at me every week when I do these things. I really like Ron DeSantis. I like his tone. I like his measured approach to things. I think he's a real conservative. I don't believe the attacks that he's some rhino, fake conservative kind of a guy. I see what he's done in Florida. Florida is now the best run state in the country. It's got the best schools, the best universities going. It's got the best economy going. It's got more people moving there than any state in the country. He's doing the best attacks on wokeism of any governor in the country. So I like Ron DeSantis for all that stuff. And what is that stuff? I just want to be really clear. That is called substance, right? That's actually doing things and getting things done. So that's what I like about Ron DeSantis. Now, I know what I just said. If you're a Trump supporter, it's probably going to make you angry. You're going to say he's some kind of rhino and you're going to say I'm disloyal to President Trump. Look, I'm really pissed off about what they're doing to President Trump. I don't like it and it makes me want to support him even more, to be honest with you. But I also think Trump is doing a bunch of asinine stuff right now. Attacking uh, Governor Kim Reynolds was a super bad move. For some reason, he continues to be doubling down on it. Like, I just don't think he's a disciplined campaigner. And I think the question that you have to ask yourself, and I want to be really clear, I'm not choosing a candidate. I want a conservative candidate. I'm going to support somebody who's a good conservative candidate. But I'm looking for message discipline. I'm looking for somebody who can win. And right now, I don't see... Trump having message discipline. And I don't see DeSantis having much of a campaign, to be honest with you. It seems to me, and I don't know any of them, so pardon my criticism, and I'm being an armchair quarterback here. I'm not running for president. I don't know how to run for president, but he's not running a very exciting campaign. It seems like his social media presence is kind of embarrassing. They keep making mistakes. I've seen him on the campaign trail. I would give him a solid B, but I don't think he's exciting the base. And I don't think he has to be Donald Trump to excite the base, but I think he's going to have to ramp it up a couple notches with Trump. I'd love to see some more discipline, maybe ramp it down a couple of notches. But to me, there are two people who seem to be connecting and doing a better job than I thought that they necessarily would. Uh, one I would say is Vivek Ramaswamy. Every time I hear that guy speak, I just think, yes, yes. I mean, I just... He's solid, he's on point, he's really clear. He does something that I absolutely love, which is he makes complicated things simple. He uses simple words to express extraordinary ideas. He uses simple words and concepts to hit the target square in the center without being overly inflammatory, but sounding to me like a true blue conservative. So I think Ramaswamy's star is rising, he could be the potential dark horse in the race. I don't know, maybe he ends up vice president. I don't know. He's been a stalwart supporter of Donald Trump and against the abuse against Donald Trump. So I really like the way he's positioning himself. Can he actually make a run for the presidency? I don't know. I think he would be dangerous in the general election against Joe Biden. I think he's an appealing figure against Joe Biden. Biden, can he make it through the primaries? Can he develop enough support? I mean, right now his numbers are way back, so I doubt it, but I like what I'm hearing. The other person who's really surprising me in the race is Nikki Haley. Look, Nikki Haley's a formidable figure, and I think people underestimate her at their own peril. Uh, she's been a governor. She knows how to govern. I don't think she did a great job as governor, to be honest with you. She did a stellar job as the U.S. ambassador to the United Nations. She had a good platform because she had a president that was doing all the right things. So I think you have to give Donald Trump, Donald Trump credit for picking her and Donald Trump and his administration, but really Donald Trump himself, credit for laying out the platform. 
but she was an excellent defender of that platform at the UN. And she's using that kind of linguistic skill, that kind of steadfastness, that kind of statesmanship in her run for the presidency. So I would watch her too. A really interesting. I'd be interesting to see uh, Nikki Haley, Vivek Ramaswamy ticket, maybe. I don't know. Anyway, don't get mad at me. I'm not anti-Trump. I'm not anti-DeSantis. Well, maybe a little bit anti-Nikki Haley. I'm pro-Vivek Ramaswamy. I think it's going to be an interesting race, and I think it's still anybody's race, but probably Trump's race to lose. I mean, he's so far ahead. Hard to imagine how that happens. The FBI scandal is continuing to explode. The Biden administration is continuing to implode in uh, perfect proportion to that. And I think it's interesting to watch this. You had the original whistleblower come out and say that they were stunted or thwarted in their investigation of Hunter Biden and Joe Biden. That seemed to be true. That whistleblower seemed to have nothing to lose or nothing to gain and everything to lose by coming out. There's a second whistleblower that has now come out and confirmed a bunch of the stuff that the first whistleblower said. Here's the thing I don't understand. If we don't have grounds for the impeachment of President Joe Biden right now, if we don't have that, then how did we impeach President Trump twice as a nation? And President Trump was about a phone call, which was at worst marginal. At worst, right? Trump would say it was a perfect phone call. I don't think it was necessarily perfect. I, Trump is sloppy in his language sometimes. How does he get impeached twice? How does he get prosecuted now? But it is very clear that the Biden family is a crime family. They are a criminal enterprise, an ongoing long-term criminal enterprise has clearly taken multi-millions of dollars from overseas governments and overseas entities not registered under the, the Registration Act that requires people lobbying on behalf of foreign uh, powers to register. Hunter Biden, I mean, let's just call it what it is. He's a disgusting scumbag. That's what Hunter Biden is, crack addict. They find cocaine in the White House. I mean... I just have no idea whose cocaine that could be. Probably some Republican stumbling through the White House where no Republicans are allowed or who go anymore, right? No, of course, it was either Hunter Biden's cocaine or somebody else in the administration, but they can't figure it out. It's because of all the cameras and all the fingerprinting technology and all the secret service and the most secure building in the world. They can't figure out who left a baggie of cocaine in the White House. That's ridiculous. That's another cover-up. So the, you've got the Biden family crime syndicate cover-up. You've got the Hunter Biden tax evasion cover-up. You've got the Hunter Biden laptop cover-up. You've got the Joe Biden involved in Burisma dealings cover-up. You've got millions of dollars going to the family for cover-up. That's enough cover-up. These guys ought to get a sort of some kind of sponsorship deal with Maybelline, right? Instead of the woke leftist men with beards that are now spokesperson for Maybelline. I don't know. Anyway, I think it's really bad. I think it's continuing to expand. I think it's going to get worse and it may yet take down this presidency before the election. So we'll see what happens. On the flip side, Trump now gets a letter telling him he is a target of the DOJ. Okay, at what point do we just say, okay, this is ridiculous. This is a banana republic. This is the way that nation states fall apart. When you target your political enemies with law enforcement, then you have become a banana republic. And that's where we're at. Merrick Garland is a disgrace. The DOJ is a disgrace. The FBI needs to be literally raised to the ground. I, I'm actually serious when I say this. FBI headquarters should be demolished. It should be raised. And that, should, that spot should be in a permanent conservation easement so no building can ever be built there. And there should be a monument to the corruption of the FBI, which started with its inception with J. Edgar Hoover. We got to get rid of the FBI. We got to gut the DOJ from the top down. We got to throw out all the leaders and try and reform it. Are there good men and women inside those agencies? I'm sure there are, but we got to start over again from the scratch. From scratch. Okay, so let's finish with what's happening in COS. Right now, it's all North Carolina all the time. If you're in North Carolina, you need to hand write notes to your senators telling them to bring up COS. We've passed the House, got to do the Senate. The Senate stalled out with budget negotiations with the House. It's really bad. It's really frustrating. It has nothing to do with COS. Handwritten notes to your senators in North Carolina telling them to move the COS resolution. The other thing happening in COS, I mentioned it at the beginning, that is the COS simulated convention taking place in Williamsburg, 
and that is August 2nd to the 4th. You can see Winston here. He's come in. He's weighing in. Winston, you're not going to the convention. He can't control himself here on the Battle Cry. He's definitely not going to control himself on the convention. So make sure, again, that you register for do a watch party. Watch the simulated convention. Go to cossimulation2023.org. And then we're going to wrap it up with my favorite part, always, which is uh, the Battle Cry Q&A. So first comes from Lady Ellen Lowe. Do you know where your new show is going to air? My answer is no. Uh, we film part of the pilots uh, two weeks ago in Nashville. I got to go out in the field and, and film the rest of the pilots. We have one episode that's complete but not edited yet, and we don't know. So there are a uh, few platforms that are interested in it. It will ultimately, it'll be on some platform, and then after it runs on those platforms, we'll stream it at the usual places. I'm going to focus on Rumble and Twitter. Maybe we'll be on YouTube if they don't ban us. Uh, Alex Gallimore said, did you watch the Tucker Carlson Forum Blaze TV that happened in Iowa. I didn't see the whole thing, uh, but I did watch some of the highlights. Tucker was his usual magnificent self. And I got to say, the thing I love about Tucker is he's one of the few journalists that won't let people get away without answering questions. I really hate that. You ask a politician a question and he spins it. They even teach this to politicians. Don't answer the question. Say what you want to say. Figure out how to spin. And I, I don't believe in that. I, you know, unless the question is intended as a gotcha question and it's dishonest, I think... If you're out there, if you get on somebody's show, you have an obligation to try and answer the questions that they ask you. So I thought he did a great job. I thought what he did to Pence was horrifying. I thought Pence did a very poor job. Uh, and I thought, uh, I don't even know Hutchinson. Like, why is he running? Like, I don't I don't even get that. So I thought Hutchinson, Hutchinson got burned to the ground uh, with the questions on transing the kids, as he should have. So Tucker, awesome job. He's the best. Mary Ellen Pervansky says, Mark, what is your take on RFK Jr.? Ah, oh, I'm going to get in trouble on this one, Mary Ellen. I've had some debates with friends on this. Look, he's a liberal. I don't like liberals. I'm going to start with that. I think he is saying interesting things. I don't think he should be shut down. I don't think he should be censored. I think that's unhealthy. I disagree with him on vaccines on the broad picture. I don't like the way we administer vaccines to kids. I think we overload babies with vaccines. I think that should be spread out. But I don't think all vaccines are bad. I don't believe there's a link. Oh, I'm going to get in so much trouble for this, but I'm going to say it. I don't believe, having looked into it, that there's any demonstrated link between vaccines and autism. Now, people will say uh, that if you look at the timeline of autism growing in the United States, it grows as vaccines are growing. That's called correlation. That's different than causation. And the one study that said there was causation has been completely debunked and not debunked by the pharma industry, but debunked, including the scientists who did that study, admitting that they faked their statistics. So when I see real statistics, when I see causation instead of correlation, there's a lot of things you can correlate and say, you know, I, I can tell you over the last 50 years, we intake a lot more chemicals, a lot more plastics, a lot more preservatives, a lot more dyes and colors. Maybe that stuff's causing autism. I don't know correlation is not causation. So I think when you're sloppy like he is, he also got into some trouble for some remarks that he made that sounded kind of anti-Semitic. I don't think he's an anti-Semite, but that's sloppy. I don't like sloppy politicians. I think you have an obligation when you are in the public eye to be careful about what you say and to be nuanced in what you say and to be cautious in what you say. And so I don't like sloppy and I don't like that about RFK. So I think he's still liberal. I think he's saying interesting things and people should listen to him. I like that he's putting out a real challenge on the left, but I think if you're on the right and you're a conservative, you should be very careful about getting drawn in by that. Bill McDowell asked, do you think Biden and his regime will flee the U.S. to escape prosecution if they lose in 2024? No, absolutely not. I don't think they fear prosecution. I think they've seen they can get away with whatever they do, and I'd be stunned to see them actually get prosecuted. I think they should be prosecuted at this point. I think we have to. I think you have to have mutually assured destruction. I think the Republicans are going to have to go after people. And if they don't, I think they're weak and they're making a big mistake. Paul Baker asks, can we get term limits and payouts on Congress with Convention of States? I'm not sure what you mean by payouts on Congress. We can definitely get term limits. Uh, I think we can prevent some of the corruption in Congress by saying there should be a lifetime ban on lobbying if you've served on Congress. So yes, yes, and yes, but I don't know what you mean by payouts on Congress. And finally, Fremont Brown asks, what makes you think the government would obey any new amendments when they ignore the ones that we have now? Fremont, I'm glad you asked that. I get that question all the time. They don't ignore the ones we have now. Like the 19th Amendment, 
right? It's they don't ignore that. They don't ignore women's suffrage, the women's right to vote. They don't ignore the 18 year old vote. They don't ignore mostly the First Amendment the Supreme Court upholds. And, and it's been getting better and better, by the way, on religious freedom. So most of this stuff that we've done, they don't ignore. It's just we're living on a con under a constitution that's been amended by uh, Supreme Court fiat. They were not supposed to have the right to amend, to add rights, to add penumbras, to add bundles of things to the constitution. That's what they've done. Our job is to take the original constitution and try and try and take the current one and make it more true to the original constitution by amendments. So if you look at the history, what you see is that the courts and the politicians follow amendments pretty generally for about a hundred years before they start drifting away. I will take another hundred years of constitutional fidelity if I can get it out of amendments. So that's all we got for this week, folks. We're out of time. I'm excited you've been here with me on the battle cry. Don't forget, sign up for the COS simulation so you can watch the Convention of States Simulated Convention at COS Simulation 2023.org. Uh, also, make sure that you go to the COS store, get your swag, get your hats, get your limited edition whiskey glasses. You can get it all there. Go to the COS uh, Convention of States.com forward slash store, get all your swag. And we'll see you next week on The Battle Cry. <laughs>